I'm Josh Liston from On The Bubble Podcast, an oral history of television fandom, part of the Gunner Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows at gunnergeeknetwork.com. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. Hello and welcome to Capes on the Couch for Comments Get Counseling. I'm Anthony Sitko. And I'm Dr. Issues. This is issue 178 and we are closing out Marvel Cosmic May with a look at the original Nova, Richard Ryder. So we did Sam Alexander two weeks ago, and then we sandwiched Galactus in the middle there, and now we're back to the original Nova, the OG, Hal Jordan. I'm sorry, I mean Richard Ryder. Sorry, it's just reading the, at least the background, there's a lot of commonalities here in the origin with Green Lantern, especially Hal Jordan. But I just want to remind everybody again, next week is the last episode of season nine. We'll be doing Miguel O'Hara, Spider-Man 2099 to coincide with the release of the Across the Spider-Verse into the Spider. Is it Across or Into? I forget which one. I think it's Across the Spider-Verse. Yeah. Yeah. Into the Spider-Verse was the first one. Across the Spider-Verse is the sequel. So Across the Spider-Verse, we're going to be doing Miguel O'Hara. In any case, let's jump right to it then, since we're not done with season nine yet. So let's get into the background. Richard Ryder, one of the most unfortunate names in comics, if you think about it. Created by Marv Wolfman and John Romita Sr. in The Man Called Nova Number 1, September 1976. Interestingly enough, uh, Richard Ryder, or at least Nova, was created by Marv Wolfman about a decade earlier when he was younger. He just kind of came up with the idea for this character, and he worked it and tweaked it a little bit then. And then years later, when he was working for Marvel, he said, you know what? I got this other idea for a character, something I've been working on for a while, something I've been kicking around in my head. And so he pulled it forward and made some major adjustments to at least the backstory. The design was tweaked, but the character overall was completely revamped. So Nova Corman Roman Day is dying. And he gives his power to Hal Jordan. I'm sorry. I mean, high school student Richard Ryder. However, he has no instructions on how to use these powers. So then he goes offline because believe it or not, he's walking on air. He never thought he could feel so free. I'm sorry. That's greatest American hero. Wow. You're, you're really laying heavy into this. Well, to be fair, this preceded greatest American hero, but. The idea that, oh, I have these superpowers and I have no idea what to do with them. It just, it kind of stuck with me. And on a side note, my high school track coach once told me that I reminded him of the guy from Greatest American Hero. Oh, In the sense of, you know, like a, like a, basically a doofus. Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mr. Smith was not really a nice guy if you weren't like an elite athlete. So. I digress. (laughs) So after some adventures on Earth, he travels to space where he helps the Zandarians battle Skrulls and other enemies. He returns to Earth and gives up his powers. This is the first time that Richard Ryder loses his power. We're going to keep track, folks. But after struggling without them, he regains them and joins the new warriors. Garth and Saul, a Nova Corman gone mad, strips Rich of his powers. Second time. So he can rebuild Xandar after Nebula destroyed it. Sal is defeated and his powers are restored. He defies the Xandarian queen in an effort to save Earth and is stripped of his rank and his powers. Third time. But when his replacement sacrifices himself to stop the Death Storm, he is returned to glory. Then we get into Annihilation, the early to mid-aughts cosmic focus. A lot of Abnett and Landing stuff. We talked about this with Galactus. We talked about it with Richard Ryder. The entire Nova Corps, save Rich, is destroyed by Annihilus. So the Zandarian world mind takes refuge inside his power ring. I mean, inside Rich's helmet. 
Rich then kills Annihilus and saves the universe. Unbeknownst to him, the World Mind is recruiting new members to the Nova Corps. And when Rich learns that Mogo, I mean Ego, the living planet, is among them, he objects and is stripped of his rank and powers for the fourth time. Having lived with the Nova Force for so long, he is dying without powers, so he borrows Wendell Vaughn's quantum bands and becomes Quasar. After saving the core during War of Kings, Ego is removed from the Nova Corps ranks and Rich is restored as a Centurion. Then he goes through a rip in space-time known as the Fault and enters the Cancerverse, where he and Star-Lord battle Thanos until the rip closes, trapping all three of them inside. And this is where the three of them remain for quite some time. Star-Lord and Thanos later get a hold of a cosmic cube that frees them, but Rich remains trapped. This, this story is told during the Bendis run on Guardians of the Galaxy, which uh, I was subscribed to at the time and not having really read a lot of the cosmic stuff prior to this, it didn't, I don't want to say it didn't land with me, but I wasn't aware of the importance of some of this stuff until much, much later. So I was reading these things going, oh, okay, well, this guy's still stuck in there. It sucks for him. Oh, it wasn't until later. I was like, oh, that's, that's Nova. Ooh, okay. That's, that's actually kind of important. So when Sam Alexander, and you can go back and listen to our Sam episode, when he contacted the Zendarian world mind to get information on his father, this alerted Rich and long story short, allowed him to escape the cancerverse. Unfortunately, because he was in there for so long, his body became a portal and the inhabitants of the Cancerverse tried to use Rich to invade Earth. He and Sam help repel the invaders. They get hold of a cosmic cube and they come home. Then once again, the entire Nova Corps was once again decimated. Seems to be a job with a lot of risks. And so Rich became an alcoholic until Annihilus showed up and asked for Rich's help to defeat the Cancerverse invasion. So after Rich swallows the entire Cancerverse. Hashtag because comics. He was killed by the Sentry, thus killing the invading forces. And then he was resurrected by Annihilus as a way of saying thanks. And it takes a lot to get Annihilus to say thank you for anything. So most recently, he took over as leader of the Guardians after Starlow was killed, which Rich blamed himself for until he started therapy. So see, it does happen in comics occasionally and not for joke purposes like i read the issue where he's in therapy and he's talking to the therapist it's it's interesting stuff maybe for season 10 like we'll do like a, a patreon thing where we'll have doc read comics where characters are in therapy and say okay that's good that's not what i would have done et cetera, et cetera. kind of graded on how accurate the therapy session goes but in any case we're going to take a dive into the issues. And the theme here is, don't worry, it gets better. I mean, worse. I, I mean, better. I mean, worse. I mean, better. And nothing displays this more than the constant flux of powers causes him numerous problems because I, I think I may have even missed one. So there's at least four, possibly five instances where he either gets stripped of his powers or in one instance, at least he voluntarily gives them up only to get them back. And it becomes apparent and a point, at, as we said earlier, his body starts dying because he doesn't have them. Yeah. So there are so many analogies I can make with this. The first one right on the surface is if you have a job and you have certain things that you're supposed to do in your role and at some point you get demoted or they just say, yeah, you're no longer a good fit for that. And maybe it's a matter of job hopping. You know, you just go from one place to another, same thing. And maybe it's a pattern of you start off great. And for whatever reason, maybe it's economic reasons and it's just a transient business. Or maybe you just aren't as good at the job as you thought you were. And people seem to sniff it out, whatever, not putting blame on it. But even if we're not talking about occupations, what if it's a situation where you have on again, off again relationships. You have friends that come in and out of your life. You have family members where you were living with them and it doesn't work out, but then you're desperate. You go back to them and it still doesn't work out. You go to the next family member and it doesn't work out with them and whatever it is. The whole point is the idea that you have a pattern of behavior 
that on one hand, you do see enough of a positive that you want to keep what you have. And then sometimes the circumstances can be out of your control and you don't have what you want or your own actions lead to responses from other people and you still don't get what you want. Either way, the point is you don't have what you want and you are now trying to find ways to regain what it is that you've lost. It can be as simple as trying again in the exact same pattern, the exact same way. And for some reason, you're able to do it all over again. Maybe you have very forgiving people in your life. Maybe you have made significant changes. I don't know. But you've established that this is the way things are. And ironically, the instability itself becomes routine. You've actually trained yourself to recognize that you're going to have this boom and bust cycle in your life of what happens. When things are good, they go well, and it seems like it'll never end. When things go bad, it's doom and gloom, and maybe this will just be the new version of it. But at some point, things are always going to change. So on one hand, some people learn to ride that wave and they actually find some level of consistent enjoyment out of it. On the other hand, some people think that this is almost like, and ironically, we're talking about cosmic stuff, but somehow the universe is is totally messing with them. And what's the point? And it almost leads to nihilism. Like, what? Wh- why would I even keep doing this if, if every time I take one step forward, I end up taking two steps back. So I'm not saying all of these things are guaranteed to happen, but for many people, that's exactly the case. And it really can influence how you go about just your regular day-to-day mundane life, even if those things aren't happening in the moment, because we all get trained emotionally with our memories to start to anticipate certain things. And yeah, it's going to lead in well into some of the other things that we're about to talk about. Yeah, you you almost, I don't want to say you make things happen by your attitude, but I mean, because that's kind of the concept of the law of attraction. But if you're always in that situation where you're waiting for the shoe to drop, then that's all you're going to focus on. And it it can take a lot to break that mindset. I can tell you, at least from experience, that it, it happened to me a lot early on uh, when I was dating my wife, because all of my prior relationships had failed for one reason or another. So why wouldn't this one fail? And I don't want to say that I was looking for things to go wrong, but there were a couple stories which we joke about now because we've been together eight years. We've been married for almost seven, but we joke about them now. It's like, hey, remember when I freaked out really early on about this little mundane thing? Or she would say, yeah, remember when like we sat in your apartment and I was crying because it was like, things are going so well, I'm just waiting for them to go bad. And then they didn't, but you, it's this constant fear. We're going to talk about PTSD, but it is in a very real sense trauma that you're accustomed to. And so for the sake of self-preservation, emotionally and, and mentally, and to some extent, physically, you have to guard yourself to prevent a complete, I don't want to say destruction, but you get where I'm, where I'm going with this, that your, your heart has been broken. You've experienced disappointment and, and these kinds of breakdowns before. So I'm just not going to let it get to that point. And that's, it's, it's an understandable and reasonable defense mechanism, but it's also no way to constantly go through life. Yeah, I'll just expand one other thing with this one, and then we can move on. So another similar cycle that may be an example of this are different forms of addiction. The idea that you are doing well, quote unquote, and yet in the back of your mind, you're wondering, okay, but what if I relapse? What if I relapse? And then at some point, it actually just leads to the fact that the stress of even thinking about the relapse leads to a relapse. So, you know, that's that's another way that it can manifest. but. Once again, it doesn't have to be that way. These are just examples. Yeah, it can absolutely become a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is not what you want. So the second issue is he feels like everything is his responsibility 
And therefore, it's also his fault that in the episode or the issue where he's talking to the therapist, he's flashing back to all of these times where he's faced with the situation and he's thinking and he remembers saying, it's all on me. It's all on me. And these these are great moments where he's going to save people and he's going to help people. And it's, it's a right thing to do. And taking responsibility for yourself and taking initiative is certainly a very admirable quality. But the flip side to it is that if it goes bad, you're also going to be the first one to blame your own self. I certainly agree with that. But I'll also challenge it and give a little different spin as to what I was observing, just even reading about this character. A lot of it is reactionary. And by definition, that's what comic books are. You have to expect that most events are based on people trying to do major influential and consequential things that for the sake of a narrative are going to be spun in a negative light and therefore a hero type of character is going to have to save or fix it or battle against whatever is happening. That's true for literary purposes. And and I get that. But for those of us that aren't necessarily living that life or don't think that we are living that life, this can seem a little weird. What do I mean by that? When you are faced with something that doesn't allow for your sense of agency, that you have control over the scenario, one of the most basic human things that we do is, okay, let me find a way to get my fit. What can I do or what is my role to take charge in whatever area it is? And ironically, when sometimes there's nothing else that can be said, then we'll take blame. We'll take fault. We'll say, I didn't do enough. Even if other perspectives may say, well, okay, maybe you didn't handle it as well as you could have, but that doesn't mean that you had as much control as you think you did. (laughs) Or let's even go that route. Let's say that you were in charge of something and something went wrong. Are there other things that other people did that also played a role in it, not necessarily saying that they need to take a role of having emotional blame or or making someone feel worse, but it's okay to actually say that there are other things that happen that aren't directly in your wheel of action, you know, in your in your center of control, your center of focus. It's okay to say that. And yet, mainly because I'm struggling to figure out a way to say this without sounding sounding negative myself, but we're pretty selfish about ourselves. We want to really think that we have more control than we do. And this is a very simple shortcut. The main problem with it, of course, is for the most part, it leads us to feel very negative. It, you know, it lets us feel anger, depression, anxiety about if it's going to happen again, et cetera, et cetera. It's not that productive unless you really are the type of person that is willing to balance it out that when the positives happen, you also take the credit for that. And what I'm about to say, I may get some flack for, and it has to do with my own experience dealing with lots and lots and lots and lots of patients. But that balance that I keep saying, that seesaw, it usually isn't balanced. What I've noticed is that for the most part, people tend to skew if they take responsibility for something and say it's their fault. They also tend to say that it was just pure circumstance or luck as to why a positive outcome happened. So they're not even getting the positive of the reward for when things go right. So it becomes this like, you know, pretty much double negative, like you're you're not getting the boost and you're willing to pull yourself down. That's what I've seen with a lot of people. And the ones that do take credit when things go right, I've noticed. And, and, if, and don't get me wrong. I know that there are plenty of people that do both. But I'm saying from a patient standpoint, my experience has been those that actually do take credit and things are positive. Often when things are negative, the first thing they do is point out that circumstances just didn't fit or blame someone else. And if I'm wrong about this, I really do appreciate the feedback. but I do think that's what I've observed overwhelmingly. I'm going to slightly tweak a a quote 
proverb, whatever you want to call it. Success has many fathers. Failure is an only child. Mm. The common expression is that failure is an orphan. I know a lot of people, and I'll throw myself in that category as well. Oh, if things are going great, yeah, we did it. We did it. If something goes wrong, it's on me. It's my fault. It's not the collective team's fault. And I think it's because there's this fear slash guilt of not wanting to throw people under the bus. That there's this notion that if something goes wrong and I say, oh, it was so-and-so's fault, that it comes down to blame or that I'm there or that I'm saying that they did a bad job and I'm denigrating them in some fashion. There's this derogatory notion around the assignment of culpability when things go wrong. And it leads to, as you said, a lot of problems because nobody wants to point the finger of blame, even if it is understandably justified. We see it in sports all the time that players will, you know, like a quarterback of a football team will take responsibility for the breakdown of a play, even if the receiver dropped the ball or there was a fumble or the offensive lineman missed their blocking assignment, whatever. The quarterback will still say, yeah, but I could have done, I could have evaded the sack. I could have put the ball in a better position. At some point, it's not your fault. At some point, the responsibility lies with another person. And then, of course, you have the the flip side of that where the quarterback will say, you know, so-and-so did this. And all of a sudden now there's hot takes on ESPN or talk radio, whatever. That, oh, he's throwing his team under the bus. He's selling out his offensive line. He's doing this and that. He's creating discord. He's not a team player. It's a no-win situation. I think what we as a society and as a species collectively need to do better with is understanding that just because something is a direct result of something that you did that doesn't necessarily make you bad or that doesn't make you it shouldn't make you the butt of ridicule it shouldn't make you the locus of all of that negativity it just means that it, you know that you bear responsibility for it. And well, I'll flip a quote that you use all the time. It is your fault, but it shouldn't be your problem. Mm -hmm. Kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So the last thing that I want to discuss, and this is one of the topics that he does bring up with the therapist in the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy issue is PTSD as a result of the numerous wars and battles. And this kind of cycles back to the first thing that we were talking about. He's a soldier. He's a soldier and a general and a leader, and many times he's a one-man army, and he has been through a lot. He has died and been resurrected more than once. He has fought countless enemies, and as a result, he can be a little gun-shy, a little quick to anger. There's a lot riding there mentally and emotionally. Yeah, and... The thing that I like to say is PTSD is the result of learning your lesson too well. What do I mean by that? If you have survived something that is life-threatening, and in his case, multiple times, then congratulations, you have become the ultimate survivor. Well, what does that mean for every point of your lifetime after that. If something has happened and any hint of something like that happening again is brought up, then you don't need to have a higher cognitive function in terms of what you're going to do because your brain is really good at shortcuts and your nervous system says, I got this. And it will do whatever it did last time and the time before that and the time before that. And just in case the person themselves may not consciously be aware of it, your brain has this amazing, and I'm using that sarcastically, has this amazing ability to say, well, here's a highlight reel. And it'll actually say, if you think that this might be a little similar, well, guess what? We're just going to 
blip it in front of you and you're going to be right there. That way, you'll know now, not just before, like I said, without conscious thinking. Now you can bring conscious thinking into it and do what you did before. Congratulations! You'll survive again. Except it's not the same scenario. It's not the same threat. As a matter of fact, it may be a very benign situation. So you didn't want to have that response, but you had it anyway. That's why it's a disorder. It's not just whether or not you're having these responses, because let's be real. If you or I permanently, like without choice, had to be on a battlefield, like including where you eat, sleep and and do all of your bodily functions and all of that while all the battle is going on around you and everything else, then in all honesty, that's not a disorder. That means that you're just going to have to do it as long as you have to survive. So be it. But once you're out of that environment and you still have these reactions, that's why it's a problem. And I think that does tie up everything else that's that's been brought up. The idea of, you know, taking responsibility for for your actions, making sure that you have radical acceptance of a situation with, you know, if something is considered your fault, whether it is or not. Well, that's because if I do it that way, I know that means I'm more careful about blind spots. If I have had these types of losses before and things like that, I know how to either suppress them or just simply, you know, channel it a different way so that I can continue to fight. You know, that all those things still happen. And on top of that, for the most part, unless you were really trying to study it, like someone in my line of work does, you're not trying to change that directly you're just making sure that whatever it is it lasts for a shorter period of time as possible or you're away from people that might trigger it even if they don't mean to or circumstances that might trigger it open spaces you always have your back against the wall or whatever there's lots of different other coping mechanisms that are telltale signs of it and there's there's really nothing easy to to just deal with it. I I wish I could say otherwise. Yeah, I was reminded of the Elton John song. I've seen that movie too, where you were saying like that in a situation where if you've been in in an environment before or you've been in a particular situation before, your brain will just jump forward and go, okay, I know how this ends and just jump forward to the ending. And you go, wait a minute, this, this is not that, but your nervous system has already jumped ahead whether you want it to or not. And to rewire and retrain at those fast forward points is not easy. And that's where, again, folks like you come in, but it, it can be very difficult. And I think a lot of the things that you were speaking about certainly apply to and can apply to any member of the military in any branch of the armed forces, as well as any emergency first responder, police, fire, EMS, those types of folks, they see those types of scenarios and they are certainly potential, potentially at risk for PTSD. So with all that being said, we're going to take a quick break. We'll plug a couple of shows. When we get back, we'll get into treatment. Stick around. Well, hello there. I'm Brian Wayne, host of the Cheers to Comics podcast, and I'm here to bring you the ultimate comic book podcast for readers and lovers and collectors of all levels. Whether you're trying to get caught up on last week's books or you're just looking to check out the latest interview with the latest creator, this is the podcast for you. So if you're looking for a comic book show that doesn't stray away from the topic and you're looking to get an insight from a true fan and lover of this industry, then tune into the Cheers to Comics podcast three times a week as I, Brian Wayne, raise a glass to this wonderful, wonderful industry that is comics. Cheers. Adventures in Aurelia, a D&D podcast with new players to learn alongside. Adventures in Aurelia, a D&D podcast where everyone has a good time. Adventures in Aurelia, a D&D podcast that is casual and inclusive. Adventures in Aurelia, a D&D podcast with lots of lore and creativity. Adventures in Aurelia, a podcast where five friends sit around the table and record themselves playing Dungeons and Dragons. Find us at adventuresinarelia.com. That's E-R-Y-L-I-A. Hi, I'm Jeremy Whitley, and you're listening to Capes on the Couch. And we're back, so treatment. (laughs) 
And then he doesn't. And then he does. And then he doesn't. And then he gets it back. What are you suggesting to Rich Ryder in terms of treatment? So before we were recording, Anthony got to experience me fumbling through, which I do all the time anyway, but not as common for treatments. What I was fumbling with was trying to explain what I'm looking to do. I had the idea, and I hope this comes across as as well as it does in my head. It goes back to the original point that everything that a comic book hero has to do is reactionary by definition. And so the heroism of someone like Richard has to do with fixing things that either have been done to him or are plotted against him as a result of other people's goals. So my whole point is, rather than reaction, I want Richard's action. He has these powers. And rather than trying to reverse the wrongs that others are doing as a result of either him losing those powers or manipulating those powers, what would he do to make an improvement in the universe? What would he do to, to gain something? And I don't mean that in the egotistical way of, well, he would just want more power. Ha, 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 ha. That's, that's not what I'm getting at. Just the idea, if we really wanted to get philosophical with it, I mean, why does the universe itself exist? If there's a higher power, it's because they figured, well, got to do something. You know what? If you've got superpowers or something like that, and it has certain ways of manipulating reality itself. Okay, do something. Cool, let's see. You know, and, and yes, I know there's huge risks with that. But, but it's at least different. Because much of what we're talking about has to do with the completely negative anxiety and anger-ridden routine of loss and attempts at restitution and undoing. I mean, those are great defense mechanisms. but what about actually living a life of purpose where you actually are putting something out? That's what I would like to see from him. And it may be something I can't even comprehend, but all right, that just gives a greater opportunity for growth. So let's see it. Yeah, it's interesting when you get these kinds of opportunities for characters that are so accustomed to viewing themselves and their powers in a certain way to reframe in a different way. You're essentially doing CBT on not just the person, but on their power set. You know, it's not just rich, it's cognitive behavioral therapy on the whole concept of the Nova force, you know, and I'll bring it back again to the Green Lantern comparison because I've been doing it enough. It's yeah, you're creating all these weapons and shields and things. What can you create artistically? This is where dare I say it, and I know I gave him a lot of flack in our Green Lantern month, this is where Kyle Rayner actually has a great advantage here. Kyle would certainly be able to come up with all kinds of interesting constructs in his, in his head. I'll give him credit there. I See, I know I, I know I crapped on Kyle a lot in Green Lantern month, but I'll give credit where credit is due. He could show Rich a thing or two. I know it's DC Marvel, get off my back, but he could say, hey, Let's do some stuff with the Nova Force. I know it doesn't exactly work in the same way with the hard light constructs, but is there something inventive and creative you can do with your powers? So out of universe, we've got somebody who maybe is fluctuating a lot in work, who feels that when things are great, it's a team effort. If something goes wrong, it's their singular responsibility and Maybe they have the PTSD from work or maybe it's because of something else, but there's this constant trauma and a hair trigger concern that something's going to go wrong any second now and I need to be ready for it. So this dynamic with whoever the mental health worker is, is so interesting because you're dealing with two levels. The first level is how the person is processing in real time, whatever their circumstance is. Let's say it's on one of the low points. They just lost that position again and they're looking for a new one or whatever and making sure they're not getting so depressed that it becomes a bigger problem and they're able to function. And you can give direct evidence saying, well, you've been through something similar before 
and what was the outcome of that. And therefore you can give positive feedback about it or, you know, just allow them to process what's happening now and reminding them that it doesn't have to be a complete downward spiral. That's actually a pretty common playbook because therapists know how to deal with depression and anxiety. It's a common thing. The other side is much more difficult because you don't want to rain on someone's parade. So if they're experiencing something that's positive, they just got a new job or or things are looking up in their relationships or whatever it is that is on the upswing again, you want them to be able to enjoy that. And yet when the person does bring up the idea, yeah, but what if, and then they point out their history, which once again is legitimate, if it's been a pattern, then the therapist can't devalue what they're saying. It's valid because once again, the the greatest predictor of future behavior is previous behavior. But at the same time, the therapist has to provide the person with the agency to say, you know what? Is there something that is different or just a slight variation to what has happened before with this situation versus the last one? Is there something that we can do together? Once again, relying on the idea that if something goes wrong, the person doesn't automatically just blame themselves. But at the same time, you don't want to be their ultimate scapegoat and then say like, oh, well, every time something's wrong is because my therapist sucks. Give them the opportunity for something different. And opening their own mental construct that something different can happen because the pattern itself is <laughs> incredibly hardwired. So from that perspective, that's that's quite the challenge. That It really is. Um, especially if we're talking, let's go ahead and add that next layer of PTSD, the idea that he, this person has that natural autonomic response to these things saying like, well, I have to be on high alert. How else can I survive it? To which the point is, well, even if you give yourself just that respite, during the good times, you'll be able to survive the low points even better than you did before. So maybe I can't change the person's entire pattern of how they react to situations, but maybe they won't be as angry or lash out when things change. And maybe they won't project earlier than expected. So in other words, maybe I can't change the idea that the next whatever, the next relapse or something happens. Okay, how about it happens in eight months instead of four months? How about instead of saying that my job is going to just completely disappear, you simply have a reduction in time, but you're still making a living wage? How about instead of saying this relationship is going to go up in flames, you guys actually just take a break for a couple of weeks and you notice that things can rekindle? Anything that you can do to show that there is a minor alteration to a pattern can lead to the pattern changing more and more each time to the point that it's almost indistinguishable from what you would say was happening prior to your intervention. And maybe that's too egotistical for me to say as a as a counselor or a therapist, as a doctor. But at the same time, what else will we be looking at? Just doing the same thing over and over again. I'm not going to say what that is colloquially. <laughs> But that, I think, would be the worthwhile goal. Yeah, it's getting them to realize eventually you make those gradual changes. And that's where the growth comes in, that you didn't get to where you are overnight. You're not going to get things back to a more positive outlook overnight. It is gradual. And you have to look at it on the long term because the day to day can be frustrating. This is something that can be very difficult for people to understand, and we've talked about this before on the show, that you can't catastrophize a bad day. They will happen. It just, it's the nature of the beast. You're going to have a bad day. It does not mean that you are going to have a bad life. It does not mean you are a bad person. And so that's, again, where the CBT comes in and getting them to accept and acknowledge the gradual nature of these kinds of things. And that's also why you need multiple sessions of therapy and not two or three discussions with a person and go, okay, I'm good now. No, doesn't work like that. Nope, 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 nope. So hopefully you get a lot of sessions with Rich Ryder on Dr. Issues' Couch. Hello, Richard. I'm Dr. Issues. Hello, doctor. So what can I do for you? Well, let's just say I'm not going to be an easy case for you. I'm not going to give you a hard time, but this road is 
not smooth at all. Welcome to challenge. <laughs> you say that now, but when I start telling you some things, it's, it's honestly, it's not even about the confidentiality. This is just some serious stuff. A lot of death, a lot of pain, tons of anger. And frankly, that's just when things turned out okay. You're building up to a multitude of events and I don't even know the basics about you. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I just, I wish you could fast forward through this stuff or just at least leave off exactly where my last therapist did. Is, is that too much to ask? I mean, do I have to repeat this every time? No, of course not. Well, I gave you permission to look at my files. Isn't that enough? I mean, what, you, you can't stomach to read it or something? W what? No, I just want your take, not someone else's. Oh, what, so you think my last therapist was a kook? Would you think it was that bad? Whoa, you're rushing to judgment way too early. Of all the people I get to take my stuff out on, I get someone who wants to start from the beginning, as if it wasn't bad enough going through it the first time. That's it. I'm out of here. I got to take a break. I knew this was going to go bad. I just, I, I'm tired of this. I get, I get all the time. People well, piss me off. And I just, well, this is going just great. Oop. Yeah. Well, I might as well rip a hole in space time. That ought to really freak someone like you out. Do you know I've had to die just so I can live a better existence? Are you trying to intimidate me or test me or I don't know what? Is this just how you vent? I don't vent. I attack. Then why are you attacking me? I'm not attacking you. Well, not you, you. You just happen to be there. It's, it, it's not like that. Richard, I'm the only one here. I get that you have no other target, but it's not productive to yell at me right now. I'm not taking it personally, but I'm still a person. Oh, you're a person. Oh, Doc has feelings. <laughs> you know, if you were out in space with me, you would not last long with that attitude. You're not trying to recruit me. I'm here to help you, remember? <sighs> yeah, yeah. Call it experience dealing with cosmic madness. There's, there's no excuse for my disrespect. This, this line of work just makes me jaded. Well, I've heard worse. Just not before I got to know. Hmm. You know what? Screw the background stuff. It's obvious that it pisses you off. What I'll focus on instead is what do you want to change about how you're feeling right now? Well, like you said, I'm pissed off, but it's deeper than that. It's, it's like something keeps clawing through me. And believe me, I've been clawed through, so I know what I'm talking about. But it's not others. It's, it's something about me. Like, like I'm not feeling how I should feel. Does any of this make sense? All right, let me see if I understand. You have intense responses to your current state of mind, and it doesn't match with what you should be feeling based on what you know about yourself. Something like that, I guess. Then what should you be feeling, if you don't mind the air quotes? I, I shouldn't even exist, you know? I should have been dead and buried a long, long time ago, but I'm still kicking and kicking ass while I'm at it. So survivor's guilt? No, I'm grateful. But how many times do I have to go through this? I don't have a crystal ball. I well, frankly, even the ones who have that type of power treat me like a wild card anyway, or, or they take my power. Sometimes I wonder if I should fight to get them back at all. Then I get pissed off even more and I, I double down and I just promise myself that if I ever get them back, I'm not going to lose them again. How many times? Like, how do I keep going? Well, you were right. I mean, from the start, you were right. This is not a smooth road. If anything, you're, you're like Sisyphus, perpetually pushing that rock up the mountain. I thought you were supposed to make me feel better. He hear me out. Hear me out. Uh, look, this is going to be a matter of perspective. I mean, you've been entrusted with a task that's incredibly important, but therefore it shows to carry with it a perpetual burden that basically resets from time to time. Yes, you can view that as a curse, but... If you say that's a blessing, I swear I no, will... No, 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 no. I'm saying it's variety. You've learned to adapt to the same goal in ways that most people haven't endured yet. I mean, that's beyond unique. That's a level of discipline that really can't be taught. If you continue to endure, 
then you're providing yourself with more ammo for unexpected challenges, even when the basic premise remains the same. It just, just think of it like this, sunrise, sunset, but no two are the same. You get me? You know, a part of me wants to rip your spine out through your chest and use it as a javelin to impale my next enemy, you optimistic, pious jerk ass. <laughs> uh. But, mm-hmm. <laughs> That can't be all there is to it, right? Like, I can't make keep my powers be the end goal. It doesn't have to be. But you are the one who said that's what's eating at you. You know, you're you're becoming a complex study, so I'm sure we're just scratching the surface. And okay, fine. You think I'm an optimistic jerk. I'm just pointing out that I'm challenging your assumptions. All right. You got a bit of a bite to you after all. No whipping out. That's decent of you. Okay, Hotshot, I'll tell you what. If you're willing to take my call, I'll reach out when I think I'm about to have someone get the drop on me. And I'll be waiting. With some antipsychotics for the paranoia. What was that? Nothing. I'll be waiting. That's my point. Right. Well, I guess it's as good a time as any to wrap this up before I piss myself off again. Later. Goodbye. I'm not even sure how this works. Does my plan cover intergalactic calls? Uh, uh, Anywho, you're... Excellency, tribunalness thing. Anyway, my, my point is, I think I'm going to take a break in my block scheduling for now. No, I didn't say I quit. I mean, your sense of time is so much different. Day is a decade to you or vice versa. Yeah, yeah, it messes with my calendar. <laughs> Plus, I, I, I had something unexpected for Billing purposes, my accountant doesn't know how to handle being one with the balance as a form of payment. So so there's yeah, yeah, there's there's some details to 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 work out. Ciao. (laughs) Talk about cosmic slop. So Rich is going to call you if he needs you, but you're done with the cosmic stuff for a while. Well, I can't just abandon patience. So. I have to be at the ready, but let's just say I expect some long gaps, maybe even lifelong gaps in terms of contact, depending on what scale they're working with. That's fair. They do tend to view things on a much different scale than you and I. So recommended reading anything from the mid to late 2000s Cosmic Marvel stuff, Annihilation, Annihilation Conquest, War of Kings, Thanos Imperative, any of those books. We've referenced them before. It's all fantastic, amazing stuff. And the thing that I I like about it is it is in Marvel, but you can read it separate from anything else that was happening with the Earthbound heroes because there was a, a good portion of time where Cosmic was really off doing its own thing. And it wasn't impacting the Earth stuff, and the Earth stuff wasn't impacting it. So you could read it free and clear of whatever the Avengers were doing. Moon Knight ain't never going to show up in these kinds of stories. <laughs> it's just, he's not, you know, you're not going to see Luke Cage out trying to deal with eternity. Like they're, they're completely different and that's okay. Different strokes for different folks. So upcoming episodes, we just got Miguel O'Hara and that's going to do it for the season. So as always, you can find all of our episodes on our website, capesinthecouch.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Capes on the Couch. And go over and check us out. We are proud members of the Guinea Geek Network. So go to guineageeknetwork.com and look at other shows. You might find something that piques your interest, whether it's Better Podcasting or the official Guinea Geek show. They've got a host of content there. There's some really awesome folks over there. Join our Discord. We've got the links in the show notes as well. Join the community going to be engaging with folks even while we're on hiatus, going to be doing some social media stuff. As I said, working on some ideas for branding and outreach, social media, things of that nature. So we got some good stuff coming up in the hopper that we'll be dropping over the next couple of months while we are taking a much needed and well-deserved break. Doc? So I can definitely say that Richard Ryder has gone through some long and hard times And sometimes he seems to get the shaft, but he does come out ahead, even when they are sticky situations. Yeah, 
Good old Dick just manages to ride it through. We waited until the end to make the Dick joke. We we waited until the end, but we had to stick it in there. For Doc Issues, I'm Anthony Sitko. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there.